Okay, I think we can start. Okay, this is the welcome session of IE 571, Analytical Models for Supply Chain Management. This semester I'll be teaching this course, and this semester we are televised, so we have to behave, and I sometimes make some uh, jokes, so I am going to do those jokes again, but I'll try to be as uh, harmless as possible. Okay, now uh, a few things about the course. You all have the course syllabus. Uh, the schedule is Tuesday morning and Thursday again morning at 10.40. And just at this point I need to check the following. Do you have the next Thursday hour, 11.40, 12.30, available? Or do you have any other lecture or course that you are attending? Thursday? Uh, well, just let me know if you have any other course, because sometimes what we need to do is we need to have two hours for the presentations. We are going to have some presentations at the end of the semester, so I may use those hours. It's still a little bit too early for that, but in, in case that we need, we, we may use those hours. Uh, in other words, we need two consecutive hours together, so that's the reason why. I'll make it up by cancelling one of the other courses. Okay, uh, this course is a course on supply chains, but uh, we are going to have an inventory perspective uh, of this course. In other words, we are going to take inventory as the basis of the supply chains. There are a number of flows of supply chains. I'll make the description and definition a little bit later on. And we are going to take the inventory perspective, meaning that our objective will be all related to, to accounting the cost of inventory that's accumulated in the supply chain. So inevitably, this perspective brings us the, the fact that inventory is kept for different reasons. And one of the main reasons that we keep inventory for is for safety reasons, in order to meet the demand. We don't want to lose customers, usually losing customer is more costly than carrying inventory. So what we are going to do then is simply uh, we are going to account for that inventory cost in the supply chain structure. So we are going to give different decisions, we are going to consider different decisions of supply chains, but it will usually be centered around inventory costs. Although in different problem structures, we are going to see that there are other costs as well, but inventory costs will always be there. That's the reason why I said we are going to follow an inventory uh, perspective in this course. Now, I'll, I'll distribute the detailed uh, uh, things that we are going to cover in this course, but let me talk about some prerequisites. Now, the, the, this is a graduate course, so there is no prerequisites in that sense. In other words, anybody can do it from scratch, but I am thinking that if you have some course, some knowledge of production planning, inventory planning, and stochastic and deterministic models of OR, uh, it is going to be sufficient to follow this course. So I don't think that it will be a problem uh, if you have some knowledge of these, Maybe not very much sophisticated, but that doesn't matter. Although this course is going to require you to have some additional work, of course, but uh, this is going to be the prerequisite. Now, there is no course textbook. We are going to use a number of papers that I'm going to place uh, at the reserve, probably. Uh, or maybe I'll just uh, send the PDF files. We'll see which, whichever is more uh, suitable. Uh, but there are some supplemental texts that I am going to use from time to time. And the first one is by Chopra and Mendel. This is usually the textbook which is used by the undergraduate supply chain course, quantitative models course. And we are going to review some chapters of that uh, quickly. And the second one is one of the early publications on uh, quantitative models for supply chain management. It is a little bit outdated, but still there are certain notions that 
one can learn from that. Uh, I'm not sure, but probably I'm not going to cover anything from that text, but it's still an important text, and I think it's available at the library. Uh, the other textbook is a case-oriented textbook, uh, textbook by Simci Levy, Kaminsky and Simci Levy. And we are going to use, I think, one or two chapters from, uh, from that text, because I think it is covered in a very nice way, although I will be probably complementing that text with something else. And the other textbook is by Silver Pike and Peterson. This is a standard textbook on inventory management and production planning. And we are going to review some material from uh, Silver Pike and Peterson. Any quantitative technique or any quantitative approach that we use in class and you're not very sure, probably the roots can be found in Silver Pike and Peterson. So it is a very strong textbook. It's not an undergraduate level textbook. It's sort of like an introductory graduate level or you can also call it like a graduate level textbook. So I think it is going to cover, it will be covered in, in, that, in that book. Now, the other one is by De Kock and Graves. This is one of the handbooks on supply chain management. It is more recent than uh, the previous one, uh, 99, this is 2003, and the coverage is, is pretty good. I think we are going to see, probably I'm not going to directly give any assignments from this textbook. Maybe at, towards the end of the semester I may give one. Um, but we will see that this is an important text, and if you really want to do something on, on this area, this is one of the texts that you should consult. Now, in this course, we are going to have the following grading scheme, although this is very flexible and I may change it within the year by simply talking to you and maybe uh, we find necessary to change certain percentages or the structure. But usually what I do is, as this course has a number of papers that we discuss or I usually describe in class, uh, what we usually have is a homework which is going to accompany those papers. So that I'll make sure that you are along with the class uh, uh, with respect to reading and following what's going on. So homeworks are going to be usually individual and it will be an important part of the grade. Now, within the homework, sometimes I give a project or a term paper, but that's very rare, and probably I'm not going to do it here. In other words, if we have less number of students, I think we will be in a total of like 12 or 13. If we have less number of students in class, then some term papers related on some technical topics would be meaningful, but I think for you, homeworks still are going to work better. We are going to have a paper presentation at the end of the semester, so each person is going to present one paper or part of one paper, and we'll see how we can arrange that, and uh, so you're going to get some percentage out of that as well. We're going to have a midterm, which is going to be 25%. Usually midterm is going to be, I, I, I'm not sure, but it will be open, open books, open notes, and open everything. And usually it is a more difficult type of an exam, but we'll see uh, how we are, I'm, I'm going to consider that. Now, I have not set a date yet, but it will be probably towards the end of March. Uh, I think 31st of March might be, so I think it's a Thursday. Uh, is it a Thursday? Yeah, I think it's a Thursday. It might be a reasonable, it's a Tuesday. It might be a reasonable date. And then we're going to have a final exam, which is going to be mostly based on uh, the papers. Uh, I may ask one question out of each paper. The questions might be very straightforward, or it might be a little bit more complicated depending on the paper. And if it's a very difficult paper, usually the question is going to be simple. If it's a straightforward paper, the question is going to be difficult. Because basically, if it's a straightforward paper, I expect that everybody would understand it. So I can ask a question beyond what is covered in the paper. If it is a more complicated paper, then it will be a question 
re get related to the nature of the paper. And it, will, it is usually much simpler. Of course, the paper is much more difficult, so I think it balances. OK, so this is going to be more or less the, the grading scheme. Any questions up to this point? Any doubts that you have that you want me to answer? OK, now uh, the course outline is given here. But what I will do is I am going to distribute you a more detailed course plan and reading material. This is going to cover almost the first 11 weeks. I may do some changes, but every, all the readings are available. So if you can pick up, I think it will be uh, two pages per person. So it will be just pick up the first two pages and pass it to your friend. Anybody who is not going to take the course but is planning to sit and listen in class. Are you planning to sit in class? Just the first hour. Just the first hour. Okay. So the others are going to take the course. So here we have 10, 10 people. And let me see. Okay. Okay, there is like the list is a little bit different, but I, I don't think that it matters. Okay, uh, the way that I have constructed the uh, course plan is as follows for every week, more or less. Okay, thank you. For every week, more or less, we have. Uh, a number of required reading. Required reading means that you are expected, well, more than expected, you, I uh, simply tell you that you should read those. So, for example, for week one, we have a lot of reading, like three chapters from one textbook, one chapter from another textbook. But this is a review material. So, uh, usually, this is going to be reviewing what we know before. And if you think that you know, of course, you can read less. On the other hand, if you think that you are not very strong in those, I recommend that you would read further. Now, then I am going to have, for each week, I am going to have a recommended reading. Recommended reading means that you are not expected to read this under normal conditions. But if you are interested and if you want to pursue a little bit more on this topic, you can go ahead and read those. For example, the recommended reading of week one is simply related to the notion of supply chain. What's the meaning of supply chain? How was it uh, formulated when it, was first, when it first came out in, in 1990s? For example, if you look at the second paper in the recommended list, like by Fisher, Hammond, Obermeier, and Raman, uh, look at the title of the paper, it's Making Supply Meet Demand in an Uncertain World, is basically summarizing what we expect from a supply chain to do. Okay, that's the reason why we are planning that. So these are usually, in chapter, in week one, the papers that you have are very qualitative papers, but they, I think, describe the need for studying supply chain. Now, for example, when we go to week number two, in half of the week number two, we are going to start a topic which is called supply chain design. In other words, how do you place different facilities in a supply chain? Or how do you plan your facilities in that specific supply chain so that the efficiency or your profits are going to be maximized? So here we have two recommended, two required reading. And there, will, there is a one recommended reading, which is important because basically that in that chapter, in chapter two of Simci Levi uh, et al., the textbook that I, I mentioned before, uh, in that recommended reading, they deal with a simple case. And so you see there how you manipulate the data, how you aggregate the data, and so on, so that you understand what you need to do in the kitchen 
of solving that problem. I'm saying the kitchen of solving that problem because the papers that we are going to see will be uh, very stylized papers where they are going to give some formulation, some solution formulation, but there will be some parameters flying all around and the meaning of those parameters are going to find some, uh, you, you will be able to find the meaning of those parameters if you read, for example, chapter 2 of Simchilevi, because there is a very large example that they solve, and they go step by step by aggregating data and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, as you can see, the, the structure is, the recommended reading is not a must, but if you think that you need, you want to go a little bit further than the, the ones that are uh, discussed in class, I think they will be very good complements. So, if I go back to the topics, the first two weeks I will be doing the introduction and review. Introduction is going to be very simple. Actually, I will start doing that. I will simply define supply chain and uh, then go ahead. And uh, review would be basically on inventory planning. So if you recall, ch well, chapter 7, 8, 9 of Chopra Mendel talks about inventory planning. And we're going to talk about those. And chapter 10 of Silver as well. So we will quickly review that material. Now, uh, I will try to answer your questions if you have any doubts on what's going on. But it will be probably a, a thorough review, but at the same time, it will be a little bit quick. So if I were you, I would start reading. If you don't feel that you are OK in those topics, start reading uh, after the lecture. Now, in week two, I will start the design issue in supply chains. We will see what we mean by design in two different examples. Uh, usually, in some other courses, you also talk, ab talk about design of supply chains. And this is going to be very similar. But as I said, I will be interested in the approaches where we also handle the inventory cost. OK, so you're going to see that we will be solving actually location problems. But we are going to take into account the inventory cost accumulated. And, it's, and we will see that it's not going to be that easy to do that. After the design chapter or, or week, then I will review some fundamental studies. Now, uh, supply chains uh, are, uh, in general, I will make a formal definition, but supply chains are uh, multi-level inventory systems in a way. So what you have is, for example, you have a factory here. So this is a factory. And then you have some distribution centers. So let me call them DCs. Okay, and then the distribution centers are going to feed some retailers. Okay, and so basically what you have is you have a system where you keep the inventory of the same item at different levels. Think about this as uh, Eti, for example, Eti Biscuileri. So what you have is you have a factory in Eskishehir. You have distribution centers all over Turkey. I think they have probably, I don't know the number, but let's say 10 of different ones in different regions. So what happens is that you have your favorite biscuit in, in the factory, stored in the factory, okay? Manufactured in the factory, stored in the factory. And then at the DC, you have tons of the, your favorite biscuit with chocolate and so on. So you really love what's going on. And then retailers are, let's say, Gima. Uh, well, Gima, we don't have Gima anymore. Do we have Gima anymore? No. Okay, we have, let's say, Tansash, Migros, and so on. And your favorite bakkal, okay? So all of them actually keeps it in their storage. So the question is, there is a huge stock of the specific biscuit that you really love. And when you are planning this whole structure, we call this the distribution system structure, you want to make sure that you are going to have meaningful stocks at each level. For example, if you keep stock here, 
you have to understand that the stock at the DC level which is feeding you, this DC is feeding, let's say, these two retailers, is going to be extremely important. If the distribution center is not operated, is not operating sufficiently or effectively, so what happens is that you tend to keep more stock here. On the other hand, if it operates very efficiently, then you keep normal stock at the retailer level. So you see that everything affects each other, and this relation should be considered. So in week three, what the studies that we are going to talk about are going to be the fundamental studies where we have multi-level relationship in the inventory system. So we call those type of system either multi-echelon inventory systems or multi-level inventory systems, and we're going to see how the inventory kept in one place is related to the other. So these two fundamental studies are by Scarf, Clark and Scarf, and by Sherbrooke. And these two studies uh, are, uh, I think, the very basic ones. If you look at the dates, you're going to see that uh, they are really basic in every sense. Now, uh, of course, what I will do is I will summarize those because if when you go to the original papers, you will see that it becomes harder to read. It's written probably 50 years ago, and it's not that easy to follow those papers, but I'll try to summarize the findings of those papers because they will be very crucial in understanding this relationship. Now, these are fundamental papers, and we're going to see some of those fundamental papers when we go into the details of a certain topic. For example, if you, go to, if you look at week four, okay, uh, the topic is risk pooling, okay, and we will describe what risk, risk pooling is, of course. And the required reading is, there are three required readings, and these papers, what these papers do is they are simply going to uh, cover the risk pooling area from the very basic, and then you can understand how certain new things are uh, placed once you know the very basics. So the, they are going to be, for example, the first one is a very basic and a very simple paper written in 1979. It's actually a note of two or three pages, but I think it describes a lot of different things. Okay, uh, so uh, week four, we're going to talk about risk pooling. And week five, I am planning to continue with risk pooling. So it, is, it takes a little bit longer because I think it's one of the fundamental ideas of uh, the notion of supply chain. And we're going to spend some time on that. And starting week six, we are going to talk about the bullwhip effect. But now, what we are going to do is we are going to try to measure the bullwhip effect. In other words, quantitatively, we're going to see whether we can measure the bullwhip effect. Uh, you might be familiar with the bullwhip effect. How many of you are familiar with the bullwhip effect? OK. Now, bullwhip effect is simply the following. Now, let's look at this system. Uh, Retailer orders the DC in some frequency. And then uh, let's say that each retailer orders once every week. So what's happening with the DC is that if these two retailers order at the same time, if their week ends at the same day, let's say Mondays, if both of them orders on Mondays, what will be the demand pattern that the DC will see, the distribution center? No demand on uh, Tuesday, Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so on and so forth. But on Monday, there will be a demand coming in from the retailers. So uh, if all the retailers order on Monday, then uh, the uncertainty that the DC is going to have will be more than the case where the retailers order randomly so it means that some of them are going to order on Wednesday, some of them are going to order on Thursday, but every day the DC is going to see some order coming in. So if you think the second case, the second case is going to have less risk with respect to DC because every day they are going to receive some information 
And using that information, they can order the factory. Okay, so this is, this is the idea. Now, the Bullwhip effect is the effect of changing the demand structure from its real course because of several different reasons. And we call most of these reasons are economic, of course. The retailers are going to order once every week because it's more economic to do that instead of ordering every day. Okay, you need to have a truck coming into your shop and every day you cannot fill that truck. So the cost that you pay to the truck is so high that you prefer to order once every week. But with these motives, what you are doing is that the DC is seeing another demand. The real demand is filtered in a certain way and the, the demand that DC sees is going to be a little bit different. Now, if DC doesn't know the real demand, then the actions of DC are going to be taken accordingly. So this is called the bullwhip effect. This is basically bullwhip. In Turkish, it is kamçı. And if you really move the whip, what's happening, what happens is that you see small circles here. The oscillations are small, and it gets larger as you go to the root. So oscillations actually represent the variance of demand that you see. And as you go to the factory level, the variance is going to become very large. And here, the real variance is, on the other hand, small. That's the reason why it's called the bullwhip effect. OK, so this is going to be something that we are going to be interested because we want to break this bullwhip effect. We don't want this bullwhip effect to affect our supply chain. And so we talk about in value of information. And then uh, we talk about the bullwhip effect. OK. And then uh, after talking about the bullwhip effect, in week 8 and 9, we talk about distribution planning. And at the same time, we talk about supply chain integration. In these two cases, the, the things that we are going to talk about will be more classical. We will be talking about more classical approach to distribution planning and logistics planning and so on and so forth. So you might be familiar with the ideas that are here, which might, the only thing which is a little bit different than the distribution planning that you see in some other courses is that we are going to have the inventory costs in the center. Okay, because we, we think that inventory costs are the driving factor. And finally, in, well, not I shouldn't say finally, in week 10, we're going to talk about cooperation issues. So now what we are going to do is we are going to look at the supply chain as a structure where the actors, retailers, DC, factory, are decentralized. And we'll see whether we can make them cooperate so that both of them are going to take benefit out of this cooperation. So we're going to talk about those. And I think I will be probably talking about some simple structures, game structures, game theory structures. But we don't need to really know game theory in, in a lot of detail. I think the models that we are going to see are simple enough to uh, understand by simply using some calculus. OK. And finally, in week 11, we, uh, we'll be talking about issues of uh, uh, product and process design. So now the idea is that if we know a lot about the supply chains, why not utilize that in designing the product or designing the process to manufacture the product? So we're going to see some ideas which is going to come from supply chain uh, analysis to the design issues. And this is where we see uh, the so-called postponement. Maybe you heard about that, delayed differentiation, postponement, uh, some success stories of HP printers, and so on and so forth. We're going to talk about those type of things. But we will talk about the, the theory underneath that, that idea. And we have excellent papers to talk about that, actually. Uh, both of them by Lee, one of them by Lee and the other one by Lee and Tank. 
Okay. And then in the weeks that follow that, our plan is we still have a lot of topics that we can cover in this course, of course. I mean, this is a by selection of topics. And in, in the remaining three weeks, we are going to have some more papers coming in, but this time the papers will be presented by you. So, and, and I will try to give some information on how to present a paper, so on and so forth. But the, the main idea is that given the infrastructure that we had in the first 11 weeks, would it be possible to use that infrastructure to read some more papers on supply chains? If we see that it is possible, then it means that we have learned sufficient in this course, or you, you already knew a lot. Okay, and you can go ahead with other papers in supply chain. If it's not sufficient, it means that we, I have not done a good job. Okay, so we're going to see what's going on. So it will be some kind of a test at the end of the semester. So don't, don't be worried about the presentations. It will be, they will be quite informal. And well, we have this camera, of course, here. But that doesn't matter. The camera is going to show everything only at, at the web. Am I right? That, that's, that's all. So we will, be, we will need to be better prepared, but other than that, this is still a course. Okay, so this is, this is more or less my plan for the semester. I may change one or two papers, but uh, the general skeleton is going to be like, like this. Any questions on this? Any questions or remarks? Any doubts? Are you still going to take this course? Okay. So there might be some people who have doubts, which is, which is fine. Uh, I don't think that it's a problem. But uh, I, can, I can talk with anybody who, uh, who has some suspicion about the coverage and whether they are, they are suitable for this course and so on. We can discuss that in the, during the break. Now, for today, what I am planning to do is simply to give some definitions and of supply chain. Why is supply chain different than any production system that we have seen up to this point? Whether it is different, really different, or is it only a different way of looking at the same system? Well, my understanding is that uh, when I studied multi-echelon inventory systems 30 years ago, there were no mention of supply chain systems. Okay? And what, what we studied at that point was basically supply chains. Now I can understand it. So this means that there, the, the theory is still there, but you give some new names to different ways of looking at similar systems so that the name is going to imply more about the system. So supply chain is a word like that as well. In other words, we had supply chains since the beginning of, of history. I mean, we know that from long ago. But the idea is that we started to use the word supply chain because at some point in time, we know that we will have, we can have more information about this whole system that we consider to be very difficult to touch. So that's the reason why we have the word supply chain. And of course, that's the reason why we have old, still old papers to study supply chain. Because the theory was developed already for different, uh, for, for similar systems in, in a little bit different aspect. OK. Now, the, I will give two definitions of supply chain. And uh, then we will, we will discuss that. Now, the first definition, this is, I think, very widely used in a lot of textbooks. But the first one is not the one that I really like. It explains a lot, but it's not, it doesn't give, so it doesn't touch the heart of supply chain notion. OK, so a supply chain is a network. Is the size OK of facilities and distribution options
that performs the functions of procurement of materials transformation of these materials into intermediate and finished products and the distribution of these of these finished products to the customers. Okay. This is usually too long for me to write, but I usually write less. Okay, now the, uh, this is sort of a very typical definition of supply chain. Let's see what is included in this definition. Now, first of all, it simply says that supply chain is a network of facilities which describes this kind of a structure. And we have different distribution options that we don't see here, but what do we mean by different distribution options is simply, for example, you can use trucks, you can use UPS, or you can use, uh, let's say, uh, trains or planes to carry from the factory to DC or from the DC to, to retailers. So there are different distribution options different ways of planning the distribution. The physical logistics can be planned in different ways. So this <coughs> basically carries out that possibility. Now we're going to see more options actually during the, uh, during the course. Okay, but the idea is that we have network of facilities and the arcs that actually bring together those facilities may have different meanings. We might have more than one arc combining the two facilities, which means that we have the option of carrying it with trucks, or we have the option of carrying it with planes, or so on. Or you can define the network in a little bit different way, so that each node is going to mean a certain transportation mode. And so what are the options? What are the functions that we actually are looking for? We look for the procurement of materials. Now, this is not included here. In other words, we have some more entities above the factory where, which actually supplies the factory. Eti Biscuitleri buys chocolate from, let's say, Germany. So imports chocolate. So there is this location in Germany which supplies the dark chocolate, and then you have the other ingredients which comes from, let's say, local suppliers. So that is also included in the supply chain, of course. Now, uh, so it includes the, the procurement of materials, transformation of these materials into intermediate and finished goods. Well, we showed here, we showed ETI as a single factory, but physical, physically, what happens is that we might have different factories in ETI. Actually, if you come to think of it, if you know the place, there are different factories. So first you have, uh, you, you process it and you, you obtain some materials which are used, then used to obtain the finished goods. So the, the uh, manufacturing that, the production that they do is, is quite simple actually. So you only have two or three stages of production. Whereas if you are, if you think about let's say, automobile production, manufacturing, then what you have is you have different levels. 
you have different parts manufactured in different countries, different factories in different countries. So they come together and it is assembled in another location. So all that is also a network. And we talk about that network as well here. Transformation of these materials into intermediate and finished goods. And then we have the distribution of these finished goods to the customers. Here, the customers might be DC, the customers might be retailer, or the customers might be real customers. You might be really delivering everything directly to the customer, like in the example of Dell computers. Okay? You don't have any structure, but you simply deliver it to Dell, to the customers. Now, this looks to be a very good definition. It, it encompasses almost everything that uh, you might think of. But what it doesn't talk about is the simple fact that the ownership of these entities might be different. In other words, this when you look at this definition, two things are hidden and of you might think that they are unimportant. One of them is the information issue. Now, who is going to make the decision in that structure? Is there anybody like central planning organizer, okay, CPO, okay, who is going to make all the decisions? So if all the information flows to this bureau or the central organization and makes the decision. Well, it turns out that in supply chains it's not the case. Why? Suppliers have different ownership. Factories have different ownership. Distribution system has different ownership. And customers are not going to obey the system they may go to another supply chain and buy another brand. Okay? So there is no loyalty in that sense, but that definition doesn't contain two issues. One of them is the information issue. The information is not going to be available centrally. Second issue is that we have different ownership of these entities in the system. So because of that, this definition by itself is not sufficient, and I prefer the definition that I'm going to write now. It's basically a network of autonomous or semi-autonomous business entities collectively responsible for procurement manufacturing and distribution activities associated with one or more families of related products. Now, uh, after the break, I'll, I'll go over this definition and we will see what is different in this definition from this classical definition. Now, by the way, the classical definition very well fits the standard understand or modern understanding of integrated logistics. This is sort of what we usually call integrated logistics in general, but this one is what we are going to consider as supply chain, and I will go over this definition after the break. Any questions? Okay, let's have a break, and then we'll come back. <laughs>